Hello, Cornerstone family. Welcome to today's service. If you are new to Cornerstone Church, thank you for joining us. We would love to help you get connected. If you are in person, please pick up a connection card from an usher and drop it in the offering. Or if you are watching over live stream, click on the I'm new button to find the form. Here are today's announcements. This is the last weekend to nominate a fellow church member to join the selection committee. Nomination is an important part of church membership and three new committee members are needed. Nominations can be made in the court at the special events table. This Sunday kicks off our newest class, Foundations of Our Faith. This is a three-week class focused on learning the core truths of our faith. Whether you are a new believer or gave your life to Christ decades ago, all levels of faith are invited. Class begins Sunday, November 12th at 11 a.m. Please sign up at the information table or online. Our women's ministry, Christmas tea is close to sold out, but there are still speaker-only tickets available for $10. Guest speaker Carrie Pomeroli will bring the laughter and joy on Saturday, December 2nd at 11 a.m. Child care is available with pre-registration for all guests. Finally, the annual Happy Birthday Jesus Party is coming soon. Kids aged two years through fifth grade are invited to this fun-filled event to celebrate Jesus' birth. Volunteers are needed, so if you could help, please stop by the kids' lobby to sign up. The celebration takes place on Saturday, December 9th at 10 a.m. Thank you again for being here today. To sign up for any of the events you heard about today, please go to cclb.org slash sign up. We hope today's service will be a time of encouragement and edification to you. Please turn your attention to the stage. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Good morning, morning. Let's stand together. Let's dive into God's word. This is Psalm 113, verses one through three. I'll read it for us. It says this. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity, the privilege it is to be able to gather like this, to praise your name, to bless your name, to worship you as we learn more about your character through the preaching of your word or encouraged and cut to the heart. I pray that you would challenge us, you would strengthen us, and God, now as we sing, I pray that you would help us as we sing to you and sing to one another, would you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
Join me in prayer as we lift up our tithes and offering as well as this service. Sovereign King of Grace, thank you that we get to gather together as brothers and sisters to praise you, to sing your praises, and to hear from your word. So Lord, we thank you for this time and we pray for our brother Simon as he brings your word today. Would it be your message? Thank you for his study. Thank you for the time he's devoted to this. Would you allow him to humble himself and to give your message today about how to reach the lost? So Lord, we pray for the lost. We pray for those who do not know yet know you. May we be bold to proclaim the gospel. So may we all herald the message of the good news of Christ died in our place for our sins and that we get to live because you now live. So Father, the many blessings you pour out on us, some of that is financial and we now turn back to give. We give from what you've already given us. So may we do so with cheerful hearts and may it be used to proclaim the gospel message to here, to Long Beach, to the United States, to the rest of the world, Lord. May our tithes and offerings be used to glorify you. We lift all this to you. It's in Jesus' worthy name that we pray, amen.
Good morning, church. The Lord is pleased at our spiritual sacrifices that are given to him that are only possible by the work of Jesus Christ, who died in our place, secures for us our salvation, intercedes for us, and that God receives our singing, our praises, and he's pleased with it. So it's a blessing to worship with you this morning. My name is Simon Viss. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm giving the word, and we'll be in Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus gives the parable of the sower. Now, if I were to ask you, what sport do you think I did in high school, what would you say? <laughs> I hear the right answers out there. This is only my thing. I don't think you did any sports. <laughs> is either I didn't do any sports or I did cross country. I did cross country and track in high school. So I, I ran long distance. And uh, in high school, our, our team was fairly good. We, uh, my senior year, we made it to the CIF finals and we, we were expected to be a competitor in winning. So we, we expected to do well. And throughout the whole year prior to that, we had won a lot received a lot of awards, trophies, and so it bolstered us, and maybe to a fault. We felt very confident in our team, and, and I did myself. So the week before our CIF meet, which is the, the it's, it's the most important meet of the season that we'd prepared for for the entire year, we ran all summer, and now it's coming down to Thanksgiving, and we, we felt so confident that we almost, we, because we were confident, we became a little lazy in that last week. We were so confident that we were gonna possibly win that we stopped doing our warmups. We stopped stretching as much as we should or as much as we did prior to the year. And there was one practice that I don't remember what we were doing exactly, but we were goofing off. We weren't doing what we were supposed to do. And as we were with, our, with my friends, my teammates, and excited about the meet, but not doing what we were supposed to do, we hear this wrath. We hear this yelling. And it was either from a parent or a coach. Either of those two, you're in trouble. And... Uh, and we hear our coach screaming at us, and he gathers us around, and, and he starts talking to us, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was of the same vein, the same vein of, do you really care about this? Do you really care? We've worked so hard for this season, and you're comfortable, you're confident, and you're good at what you do but do you care enough to keep doing the things that you're doing? We are on a mission to win, and you're just gonna forsake all the things that we've done up to this point, forget about it, and then hope to win this next meet? It's probably not possible. So in a sense, he was asking if, if we really cared, if we really cared about winning. 
So in our evangelism series that we're going through as a church, we are on a mission as God's people. It is our responsibility, our job that is initiated by Jesus Christ to reach the world for the sake of the gospel, that they would hear the good news and lost people would come to be saved, that lost people would know the glories of our God, the God that we have just worshiped and that we're worshiping this morning, that they would know that truth. And so a question can be asked for us this morning, do we care? Do we care about the lost? Do we care about lost souls that are on their way on a trajectory toward hell, damnation, and God's wrath? Do we care? So I think in turning to Matthew 13, we can see the care from Jesus in his teaching, the examples that he gives. And uh, and before we get there again, some of you are, are planning your your family vacations and your family gatherings for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're in that season and I'm thinking about it myself. And if you're like me, I know that meeting with my family, gathering with my family, it's like they're, it's a, it's a messy bunch. And, and you know that there are people that maybe you've been praying for for a long time and that the past few years or however long you've been gathering with them, things can get awkward because of different life stages or maybe your kids have financial struggles and you're really worried about them or they're on a completely different trajectory in life and you're worried. And, and that comes from a good place. But is there also a worry that they're not, they may not be saved? And if they're not, do I care enough to minister to them? and actually preach the good news to them. So a challenge for you from the, from the outset of are we thinking about this as, our, as the holidays are coming up and gathering with our friends and families. So Matthew 13, verses one to nine. I'll read and then we'll pray. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him. So they got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were, scor- they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your word uh, would be received by open hearts. We ask that you would encourage us and challenge us, and that it would move us into a trajectory toward worshiping you all the more, giving praise to you, that we glorify your son, and that your spirit would mold us, encourage us, and motivate us to reach the lost to hold the message of the gospel in our hearts and not be ashamed of it, that we are not ashamed of our Savior. And so we also pray for those that we have have in mind, that we have been praying for for a long time, that you would save them, open up their hearts, give them ears to hear. As we look to Jesus' words, may he be glorified and may it be, again, encouraging to us. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So at this point in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins his third teaching discourse. Throughout Matthew, Jesus is teaching a lot. And in this third section of teaching, Jesus starts teaching in parables. And he starts using earthly language to discuss heavenly things. And his disciples 
question, after he gives the parable of the sower, he, they question, why are you teaching in parables? Why are you doing this? And Jesus says, it's to reveal to those the kingdom of God whose ears are given, who are enabled to hear the good news. It's for them. And at the same time, it's to conceal. It's to conceal for those who have hard hearts that don't have ears to hear. It's actually to fulfill prophecy from Isaiah that the kingdom of God would be given and that there will be those who hear the good news and then there will be those that reject it. And we see that throughout all of Jesus' ministry that he's giving the message of the kingdom of God and there are those who choose to follow him and those on the outside just reject him. And then there's people in between. And by in between, I mean those who are really attracted to the words of Jesus. Jesus is a popular guy in the gospels. There's always a crowd following him and they want to learn from this man who has an authority that is unlike anything they've ever experienced. They even recognize in Mark chapter 1, 27, that he has a great authority. Mark 1, 27 says, and they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. We also see in the, the gospel of John that there are those who followed him and a great crowd was, was trying to follow him and then he would give a little more difficult teaching and they would fall away. So they followed him for a while, but then there was a certain point in his message that was convicting or that it was too hard, too difficult to understand, so they fell away. And so it is with the parable of the sower, or I should say the parable of the soils, because this is what the parable's about. It's about the soils. And Jesus' purpose and his teaching in the parable is to show us, to reveal the heart of man that there are going to be different responses to the good news. There are gonna be different responses because the heart, from Jeremiah 17, nine, the heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful and it will either reject or manipulate the message to say what the heart wants it to say or the heart will be softened. It will be open and it will receive the good news and it will plant, it will, establish a good root that will give and grow good fruit. So Jesus, giving the parable of the sower and what he taught, what he taught was the kingdom of God. He taught that the kingdom of God was at hand for sinners to repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1, 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. So from Verses one and two, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables. Now, before we get into the parable, I just want us to recognize that again, the model that Jesus displays for us. Last week, Randy, Randy preached on, on Jesus being the model for evangelism that we are to look to. And I think here's another good example of that. Jesus had just spent a lot of time with a bunch of different people. And to me, when I read this passage or when I read the context, it sounds exhausting to me that Jesus would spend so much time in different contexts. He just sparred with the Pharisees he delivered a demon out of an individual and then he fellowship with other people in one of their homes. And now he's by the Sea of Galilee and there's a crowd gathering around him and it's all, it almost seems as if they're pushing Jesus into the boat. Maybe not forcing, but for some reason, Jesus gets into the boat and what happens is the boat becomes Jesus' pulpit. Jesus takes the opportunity to teach and to keep delivering the good news of the kingdom of God. So here in the first couple of verses, before he even gives the parable, we see that Jesus is a man of opportunity. He's an opportunist. Take some time for yourself in thinking about this last week. 
in the past seven days? Was there ever a time or could you think of any time where you actually had a spiritual thought come to mind? Was, was Christ actually exemplified in your mind or in your heart? Did a spiritual conversation ever come up, maybe potentially with someone who doesn't believe? Did that happen this week? And praise God for that. There are opportunities for us that God even presents to us daily, I think, that sometimes we may not even be aware of. Jesus took the time to teach and proclaim the good news to the masses at even inconvenient times. And Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, whether in of season or out of season, meaning whether it's convenient for you or inconvenient for you, preach the word. And so in, a, in our sin of, a, of autonomy, that we, sometimes we decide what is convenient or not to preach the good news to somebody. And what we'll get into the, with the soils is we can prejudge soil and that determined for us who we're to preach the good news to. But Jesus preaches the good news indiscriminately. And Jesus, being omniscient, being God himself, he knew the heart of men. John 2 says that he didn't entrust himself to men because he knew what was in their hearts. But that did not keep him from teaching the good news to them. No matter what, where their hearts were, he, and with the sower, and the sower is Jesus in this parable, Jesus almost seems sloppy in throwing seed. And it fell on different soils. But though different heart responses, there were different heart responses to that seed, to the message, Jesus still gave it. And so we are to do the same. And the reason why people gathered around him, people, people were interested in him, people, people viewed him as popular and wanted to follow him is that his authority was deeper than just knowledge. Jesus didn't come to change your mind. He came to change your heart. He did not preach to your head, he did, but he desired to preach to hearts, and he did. This is the type of authority he exuded because Jesus cared. Jesus cared about lost souls. From Luke chapter 19, 10, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And Paul confirms in his letter to 1 Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so that was the message that he came to save sinners. So then verse three starts, and he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. So who is the sower in this parable? The sower is Jesus. The sower is Jesus. And it, if we belong to Christ, if we proclaim him as Lord, we've given our lives and we have received the gospel message and have responded to it and have borne fruit, then we, Jesus gives the command that you are to teach all that I have commanded you. And so as we identify with him, we are sowers as well. So when you read the passage, Jesus is the sower, but if you are saved, if you proclaim Christ as Lord, then you are a sower as well. And then we get to the soils. Well, what are the soils? What are the soils? The soils are hearts. Different heart responses to the seed. And what is the seed? The good seed is, if you turn with me to verse 19 in chapter 13, Jesus explains this to his disciples. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, it's the word of the kingdom. The good seed is the word of the kingdom. So the three questions we ask and answer for this parable is, who is the sower? The sower is Jesus. And by definition, those who identify with Christ and who are in Christ, they are sower, we are sowers. And who are the soils? The different heart responses to the seed. And what is the good seed? The good seed is the good news. It's the the news of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now, to clarify what the good seed is, 
And the reception of the good seed, the reception of the gospel has nothing to do with the seed. And what I mean by this is that the seed is always good. It is always good. It's the soil that could or could not be good. And the only bad seed that we sow is anything but the good seed. And we have to recognize that the good seed is the gospel message. Nothing less than that. Now you might, and many of us, many of us throughout our spiritual walks have maybe, maybe claimed or identified that we've planted good seeds in people when in actuality or in reality, it wasn't good seed because it wasn't the gospel. So if you told someone this week that, hey, I'm going to church this Sunday, and you think I planted a seed in their heart, the Bible says that's not a good seed. That's not the good seed. That's a good conversation starter, and those are things that we should be bold in proclaiming, but that is not the seed. Telling someone that you, you go to church or you're going to a Bible study, to even telling someone that you are a Christian is not, a, is not the good seed at least described here in the passage. And so we have to recognize what the good seed is. And once we recognize that, we are able, we are able to see and recognize of what seeds we're actually planting and maybe even quantify that. The good seed is proclaiming the good news to somebody. In evangelism, the definition of evangelism is that you proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a non-believer. That is the definition of evangelism and that is planting a seed. So verse four, Jesus begins. He says, a sower went out to sow and he, as he sowed, some f- seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Turn over to verse 19. Jesus explains what this means. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So this first soil is the soil of the path, the the hard stone path that the seed is landed, but the heart that is so hard, it, reje- it immediately rejects it and a bird picks it up. And what Jesus describes here is that it's the evil one, Satan. Satan snatches it and grabs it. And this is Satan's prerogative. Satan's prerogative is that no one hears about the glory and majesty of God. And those who have hard hearts, Satan, who is their master. And you may, you may be a non-believer here. Some of you don't buy into this Christianity stuff. There's, for some reason, you came into this place, whether your family made you or you were invited or maybe you're, you're searching for, for spiritual truth, whatever that is, you're a non-believer. And friend, you're, one, you're here for a reason, but two, you may think that you live your life on your own, or you get to determine how your life is lived. And, uh, and the Bible recognizes, one, that that is sin, but the Bible also recognizes that you actually serve a master. If you're not serving God, you might be serving yourself, but in hindsight, spiritually, you are under the slavery of the devil, that your master is actually Satan, and that you belong to him. And so those who are along the path, those whose soiled hearts are the path, they are those who do not understand the gospel. They receive the gospel, but they do not understand it. And these are hard hearts. So the first soil is hard hearts. And again, if you're an unbeliever here, friend, you might be apathetic, uninterested in the message of the kingdom. Maybe you dislike Christianity for some reason. There are plenty of reasons for that. First Corinthians 1.18 says that for the word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So this may sound just foolish to you. It sounds folly to you. It doesn't make any sense and it doesn't have any meaning to it. It doesn't have any meaning for you. But friend, let me ask you this. Where do you think you'll go when you die? 
Do you believe you'll go anywhere? What is, is there life after death? And you may not think that there's life after death, and that's a different conversation. But I think much of the world believes in the afterlife because whatever's sown on this earth, whatever's done on this earth should be good things. And you may even think that you are a good person. And because you're a good person, that God, that if there is a God of the universe, that he'll let you in. He'll let you into heaven because you've done good things. Well, the Bible tells us that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us. It's what unites us as human beings that we actually have a sin nature and that there is a God. There is a God who created us, who created the universe and he's Lord over it. And he, and he had right relationship with us as he created mankind, but mankind fell. Adam, in representing all of humankind, he disobeyed God and therefore we have inherited original sin. We have inherited a disease, a condition, a nature that we defy God, we reject him, and we don't understand him. So God, in his love and his mercy, he sends Christ. He sends his one and only son to fulfill all things of the law because we can believe that we are good people and that, yeah, God is up here and maybe I'm right here because I've done good things. And much of the world will believe that, that God is just this mountain peak and there are many paths to getting to him as long as you just do good things. But for Christianity, we're not even on the same mountain as God. The holiness, the chasm is so big for how much we've fallen short of him because have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever stolen? If you've done any of those things, and if we're honest, we have. We have fallen so far below the standard of God that we deserve, the only thing that we deserve is punishment, is death. But God sent his one and only son to die for us in our place and obeying the law perfectly, which you could not do, and justifies us by being raised to life, raising to life for you in your stead so that if you are in Christ, you not only died with him, but you are raised with him and you are reconciled to God and Jesus in his resurrection and ascension to his proper place being at the right hand of the father, he intercedes for you. He intercedes for you currently, and this is good news, that Jesus lives, he doesn't die, and you are secure. And the only response that he requires is that you repent and believe. You repent of your sins and believe in the gospel message. You believe that Christ is Lord. Repent, agree that, God, that you need God, that God alone saves you. It's not by works, but the gift of God. It's gracious gift to you. So if you're an unbeliever and you hear this message, repent and believe, respond to the gospel. So this is the soil of the path, the hard heart. We get to the second soil in verses five to six. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where you did not have much soil, And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Turn to verses 20 to 21, Jesus' explanation. As for what was sown on rocky ground, the rocky soil, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the rocky path is the heart that receives the good news with joy at first. But when tribulations come or trials come, they wither, they fall away. These are the shallow hearts. The rocky path is the shallow heart that it, it, the good news comes into the heart, is received with joy, but it doesn't take actual root. 
It, the root isn't deep enough. So there are many people who will receive the gospel message and let's say, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. Jesus sounds awesome. And yeah, I'll give my life to him. But when in fact, their heart is telling them something different. Again, the heart is so deceitful that it, translate, it can translate the gospel, the good news into something that it's not, that we determine what the good news is to us. And thereby it actually becomes Not Jesus is Lord of my life, but Jesus is part of it. I only want Jesus to be a part of it. Everything else, as long as my life is good, Jesus sounds great. But again, when trials and tribulations come, they recognize, oh, maybe God isn't as good as I thought he was. Or I had this different interpretation of who Jesus is. But Jesus doesn't hold back about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in allegiance to him. John 16, he tells his disciples, in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Part of what it means to be a Christian is that it, we are to receive persecution because the gospel is offensive to people. First Peter 4, 12 to 13, beloved, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice. Christians are actually called to rejoice in persecution and in trials. Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. That this is what it means to be in Christ, that we receive sufferings as part of identifying with him. I read Acts chapter five and every time I'm floored by the apostles' reaction to the Pharisees when they tell the apostles, you need to stop preaching Jesus Christ. You need to stop preaching this Messiah or we will beat you. And they do. They whip and they beat the apostles. And what is the apostles' response to it? They rejoice. They rejoice that they were able to identify in that moment with their Lord Jesus Christ in his sufferings, that their sufferings were actually a sign that they were in Christ and that he was Lord. Romans 5, three through five, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So Christian, suffering is a part of the Christian life and it's even allowed by God to form you in the likeness of his son and actually point you to the hope that he has promised us, which is eternal life. And so you may be going through suffering in this very moment and it's unbearable. Look to Christ. Christ bore your eternal sufferings so that you would not have to bear that, but actually look to him in the hope that your life with him is to come. Then verse seven, the third soil. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. In verse 22, Jesus explains, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. So the third soil is the soil with thorns. This is the heart that receives the word, but the cares for the world overwhelm and choke out the word. It's the heart of thorns. So the first heart of soils is the path. Second, rocky soil, which is a shallow heart. And the third is the soil with thorns. And this is the heart of thorns that the riches materialism of the world, it actually chokes out and it it holds allegiance over a person rather than Jesus. So this is another person that might receive Jesus and say, that sounds good. As long as I'm rich, as, as long as I'm receiving all the materials that I want, Jesus sounds great. But eventually 
those riches and that materialism will outweigh and outdo anything that has to do with Christ. Mark 10, 17 to 27 is, the, is Jesus speaking with the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler comes to Christ, comes to Jesus and he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the law. And it, the rich young ruler responds with, I've done all those things. I've done all those things from the very beginning of my childhood. And so what, what else is there? And Jesus, it says that Jesus had love for him. Jesus loved him. And what does he do with this affection toward the rich young ruler? He says, you have not done one thing or you, you have one thing that you have yet to do. Sell your possessions, follow me. And how does the rich young ruler respond? He weeps, he mourns, and he walks away because he recognizes all of his possessions and he didn't want to give those up. His allegiance was to his stuff, to his riches. When he actually told Jesus, I've actually followed the law. And what's ironic about that is that he actually disobeyed. He, he sinned by committing, I'm sorry, losing my train of thought. What's ironic about this is that he disobeyed God by disobeying the first commandment, which is, you shall not have any gods before me. The God in his life was riches. And so this can be an example of those who receive the gospel, but their, 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 their passions, their passions for riches or the materials that they accumulate, that it far outweighs anything that Jesus has accomplished for them. And Jesus, in verse 23, tells the disciples, after talking with the rich young ruler, he looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now, wealth isn't a bad thing. It's not, but it is difficult. It's difficult for the desires of the world and being wealthy, for that to not consume your life. And it, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So to you who are, are struggling with your finances, or if, you've, if you thought way more about your finances this week than anything about Jesus, Mark 8, 36, Jesus tells, tells us, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? In Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And in Matthew 7, Jesus gives a, a harrowing teaching on the, the, on the gates. Wide is the gate that, and the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that actually leads to life. And there are few that find it. And you shall know them by their fruits. I went to Germany while I was in college and doing some ministry work with high school students and teaching them English. And it, it, and it ran like a camp. And one of the things that the students were, were able to do or that they got to do, and they won some competition for something, but they got to do whatever they wanted to me. Like that, that was their prize. Like whose idea was that? <laughs> and and they, they, decided, they decided that they were gonna dye my hair. And they were gonna dye my hair crimson red, a terrible color. It looked awful. But they, they dyed my hair and it was just bright, bright red. And you could probably tell that it's, it's fake. It's either a wig or he did something with his hair. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't look natural. But as, as the dye faded away and it, and it started turning pink, which was awful, <laughs> but it showed my roots. It showed my roots that in fact, the truth was I wasn't really a redhead, that my true roots were showing. And church, so it is with those who can receive the gospel at first with joy, even those that receive it, but they have their finances, their treasures in mind, that their true root will show because good fruits or good roots always produce good fruits. Bad fruits show bad roots. 
that eventually the roots are going to show. Your roots are going to show. And this is what the parable reveals to us, that if there are those who had shallow hearts, those who had thorny hearts, that their roots are going to show, that the lack of fruit is going to be there. And even with the, the path, the soil of the path, that it, it didn't even take root, they, they rejected it. So these three soils, these three soils are not those who have allegiance to Christ, those who do not understand the gospel, those who have not received him. And even the, the people here at Cornerstone, that there might be people here externally that they may look like Christians, they're serving in ministries, they're doing all these things, but their roots are going to show and show that their hearts were actually of the thorns, the rocky path, or the path. So this should be sobering for us and for us to take inventory of our hearts, of looking at the soils of where, where does my heart align? So then we get to verse, verse eight, and this is the fourth soil. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. Verse 23, Jesus explains, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and another 30. So this is good soil. This is the receptive heart of the gospel. This is heart that God, a heart that God has enabled, that, a heart that he has softened to receive the good news with so much joy that it takes root and it actually produces growth. It actually produces fruit and of different quantities, different quantities of the same quality. So what's interesting in this parable is that in the first three soils, the path, the rocky soil and the thorny soil is that those three soils are different quantities of the same quality of heart. Different results of the same heart and that is a hardened heart. But then you get to the fourth soil and that is one good soil that produces different quantities of fruit of the same quality of heart. The quality of heart that has been softened, that recognizes the truth of Jesus Christ and their own sin, and that they recognize Christ as Lord and they hold their allegiance to him, and therefore different fruits are produced. But Jesus, but God isn't interested necessarily in the quantities of the fruit, but the, of the quality of what is being produced. So there are gonna be people that exist today and have existed today that the hundredfold of their harvest is massive and it points to, points to the incredible things that God is doing through a person such as Billy Graham. Billy Graham brought many people to the Lord and that could be an example of the hundredfold. But then there's the 60 and there's the 30 and those are still good harvests, but maybe smaller in quantity, but still are able to point back to our sovereign God who is able to change any heart, any heart in any place and use any instrument he chooses to. So if you think that I'm not producing enough fruit I don't have enough quantity as someone else or someone next to me. I haven't led as many people to Christ. This is not our God. Our God is sovereign even in the ordinary means and uses you in your places of stewardship to preach the gospel and should encourage us in our evangelism that no matter how small your neighborhood is, no matter how small your workplace is, no matter how small your sphere of friends are, that there's still harvest there and still good fruit to be had and God could be using you. So this different quantities of fruit show the same quality of heart that holds allegiance to Jesus. Now, this, this softened soil, the good soil, it doesn't mean it's perfect soil. And we understand this, or I hope some of us understand, or I hope we all understand this, that the good soil is not perfect, meaning that there are going to be times where our hearts in our lives, if we belong to Jesus, there are gonna be times where a rock gets placed into our soil or thorns come in and try to quench the word out. 
There are, go there are going to be times where you experience suffering, persecution, where you are going to sin against God in your being in Christ by looking to finances, by looking to relationships that are outside of marriage, that you're gonna do these things. These are going to happen. And this may hinder our evangelism, that maybe the reasons why we're not evangelizing or we don't have motivation to is because there's ongoing sin in your life. That sin is keeping you from doing this. Christian, this morning, this could be the time to confess, repent of your sin and recognizing that the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you and that if you confess, you may be healed and actually be the good vessel that he has bought for you, that has established for you in bearing good fruit. Rest in Jesus. Maybe you're facing a trial or some persecution in your life. Look to Christ again. Romans 8, 34 Paul says, if you belong to Christ, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. And more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Rest in Christ this morning. If you have sin, confess, repent of it, receive, continue to receive the goodness and wonderful mercies of our God. So we know that the sower is Christ and those who belong to him become sowers. They sow the good seed, which is the gospel message and the four soils are different responses to that message. And a natural question I think that arises is who, who really has the power to save? Who has the power to save and who is able to change a heart? Whose responsibility is that? We can see this as a tension between man's responsibility and God's responsibility. But I don't want us to see it that way. And the Bible doesn't treat it that way. I want us to give credit to whom credit is due. Psalm 62, two says, God alone is our rock in our salvation. Ephesians 2, eight, this is not a result of good works, not a result from man, but is a gift of God. But the Bible places the categories of what responsibilities we have. God's responsibility is to save. God's responsibility is to change hearts. Man's responsibility, his graced responsibility, his privilege is to sow seed. Christians' responsibility, their call, their mission is to sow seed, to preach the good news. So we are co-heirs in what we receive with Christ and co-laborers. First Corinthians 3, 9, Paul says, we're God's fellow workers in proclaiming the gospel message that God would actually use us as instruments to herald the good news. Church, we have to see this as a privilege. We have to see it as a privilege that we represent the God of the universe as his messengers to provide the speech of his declared salvation for sinners. Church, it is good to be the mailman of the divine royal post office. That's what we are. We're, ma we're just the mailmen. But it's good to be mailman because the responsibility for, to save, to change a sin nature, that belongs to our holy God. And do we trust him to do that? Just as we trust, trusted in him because he did it for us. The healthy burden, and this is a light yoke that Jesus promises us. It's a light yoke of proclaiming of the message of the gospel. It's our grace responsibility and I think it's a fruit of our conversion. But the burden of saving lost souls, changing the sin nature, just as I couldn't change the color of my hair, I could not change my roots. No one could ever do that. Man, humankind cannot change another human's heart. That responsibility belongs to our divine creator and our savior He's the only one to do it. 
He's the only one who can draw people to the Lord in reconciliation. That is not our job. We plant seeds. We don't change the soil. God alone has the power to do this. You cannot will something that isn't yours to will. You cannot grow a seed. That's not our job. We cannot tend the soil. No one is able to soften the soil of anyone's heart. And as believers, we can become burdened by that. Or we can become burdened because we think it's our job or our responsibility to change somebody. It's our, we feel the responsibility to save someone. We want to be the hero. We wanna be the hero. But there has never existed, there has never existed anybody, a minister of the word, a pastor, there's never existed a minister of the word that has ever changed a heart. And you can combine all the faithful and powerful ministers in the world and they together could not change one stony, cold heart. They couldn't do it. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So even a good minister and a good faithful servant to Jesus Christ who understands the gospel, they understand that the burden of saving someone is carried by Christ alone. That belongs to Christ. Christ took that for us. That Christ, who not only came to give the message of the gospel, but he was the object of it. He came to proclaim the good news, but he was the good news. He is the good news. He is the one who stands in our place, who took on our debt, who paid your penalty and is actually the one in whom we put our faith in for our salvation and for the salvation of others, the people in your sphere. At the same time, we cannot, we cannot sit on our couches thinking, you know, only God can save them. There's nothing I can do. Only, only God can save this person, so I'm just gonna remove myself completely from it. Romans 10, 14 to 15 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful the feet of those who belong to Jesus that he has given us the privilege of proclaiming this great news to lost souls. Christian, Christ paid too big of a price for you to sit on your couch and watch six hours of Netflix every day. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with watching TV, but Christ paid too big of a price for us to be heralds of the good news, to be the light, to be the salt of the earth. That they, are able to, that they would be able to look to Christ and bring him glory. The medical field doctors have spent a lifetime trying to figure out the cure for cancer. But let's say that they figured out the cure. How good news would that be? That there is actually a cure for this disease and those who have made that cure, created that cure, discovered it, that we are gonna give praise to them and give them honor because they figured it out. They've cured the disease and this good news is gonna be spread because there's actually a solution to this massive problem in our world. How much of the good news should we be preaching of the disease that we have as sinners, that we are evil and are the, the problem of the world, but that there's a solution to it? And that was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the cure. He's not just preventing. He's not a preventative. He is the cure. So are we giving this good news that there's a cure for our disease? And not only a cure, but a glorification waiting for us that belongs to Christ, but that we have received every spiritual blessing that belongs in heaven through what Christ has done. That is the good news. That is the best news. 
So to apply, apply this in our evangelism and our seeking the lost. Are you trusting in the Lord's sovereignty, his power and timing to accomplish his will? The people that you are thinking of, the people that you've been praying for, from the very beginning of the series, we asked you of two or three people in your life that you could be praying for and taking action steps to minister the gospel to them. How has that been going? Have you been praying for them? And if you haven't, we're actually gonna take the opportunity to do that. In a little bit, I'm gonna break us up or I'm gonna ask you to find two or three people next to you and share the people in your life that need to be saved, that are lost and you've been praying for, to commune together and to take comfort, comfort with brothers and sisters that the power of prayer means something. Prayer means something. There's power in it. And prayer is the means by which God uses to save his people. It should bolster our prayer life that we look to God and ask for his intervention in changing the hearts we are ministering to. So our responsibility, our grace responsibilities in sowing the seed and praying for them. So before you're even ministering the gospel to those people that you have in mind, are you praying for them? Are you giving them to the Lord? Because that also shows a sign or that is fruit of recognizing that you cannot save them. It is only God. But it's in our partnership and our co-airing and our co-laboring with him that he is Lord over it all. So are you praying for them? Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, he says this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. There's winsomeness here. There's, there's grace here that needs to be exuded from us in preaching the good news and uh, looking to the soil, but not prejudging it because this is a danger for us as well, is that we can uh, prejudge a heart and say, they're not gonna wanna hear this. But to model Jesus, he gives the gospel indiscriminately. No matter whose heart it is, no matter how hard, it, how hard hearted it is, God is to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And it is God's job to soften them and bring them to him. So for 1 Timothy chapter two, Paul says, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our savior. In 1 Thessalonians five seventeen, we are to pray without ceasing that our prayer life actually shows that we care. We care about the lost. We care that God would save them. So I'm gonna ask you now to, uh, to apply this challenge directly, that meet with the people around you. Two, groups of two or three, you could be bigger if you want, but take maybe five, six minutes and share Share with fellow saints, those you've been praying for, those whom you want to pray for and seek intercession for them to to our God. So I'm gonna leave you to five or six minutes. Introduce yourself to new people. Pray together that this is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. And I'll come back on stage and pray for us.
Bible Church, I hope this is uh, encouraging for you to even uh, meet, maybe meet new people and to fellowship together and pray for the lost. I encourage you that if you're still still praying or you haven't gotten to pray, to meet together after, pray for the lost. This is the heart of our church. This isn't just a teaching series that we wanna implement and check a box for it. We want to establish and foster a heart of evangelism, praying for the lost. So pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the receiving of your word. May it challenge us to, to reach the lost, to take our job and our responsibility, not only seriously, but with grace, that this is a privilege to really be male men, male men and women who love you and can't help but share the beauty of our Lord, that you've saved us and you've saved the lost, that there are lost people out there, lost people in here as well. Would the gospel seep into their hearts? Would you soften them? There are family members, there are children, there are lifelong friends that, are, that we feel burdened for. Hear our prayers, save them, Lord. Use us as instruments to minister the gospel. And if it's not us, would it be by other means, ultimately to glorify you? We pray these things in your son's name, amen. amen.
You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Amen. They're going to be pastors up here on the front and elders in the back for prayer and to continue to pray for the lost in your context. But from God's word, Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the one only God, our savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessings to you. See you.